Good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Olson from Signature Sounds. Welcome to the Backstage Sessions, another in our Sunday night series, Conversations About Music, that we've been doing all winter long here at SignatureSounds.com. And now we've got a special show for you tonight, two wonderful singer-songwriters who I'm pretty sure you both know well, um, Greg Brown and Jeffrey Focal joining us tonight. Both Jeffrey and Greg are donating uh, their portion of the tips to the Cafe Carp, which is a great venue in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. It also happens to be the place where uh, Greg and Jeff met 20 some odd years ago. And um, these guys have spent a lot of time in green rooms talking about music over the years. Old friends, and it's gonna be uh, terrific. Just to uh, give a Brief introduction, uh, Greg Brown, one of our most cherished songwriters, a man who's written so many fantastic songs. Greg Brown was indie before uh, indie was cool. We throw on that term indie, but uh, he has really had a uh, self-propelled career just from the beginning, back when it was hard to do such a thing. In the 1970s, he came along, released his debut album in 1980, and then uh, in 1983, joined up with his friend Bob Feldman to form Red House Records, one of the first sort of artist-driven uh, labels that came along. This is way pre-internet. It wasn't an easy thing to start a record label back then, but they started Red House Records, a great label that uh, continues to this day. And of course, uh, Greg has given us a long string of great solo albums, um, He's won, he's been nominated for Grammys, won other awards. He, of course, his songs have been uh, covered by all kinds of people from Joan Baez to Gillian Welch, Lucinda Williams, Sean Colvin, Mary Chapin Carpenter, and many others. Uh, Greg was born in Southern Iowa. He continues to live in Iowa today with his wife, Iris Cement. Uh, Jeffrey Foucault will be the first to tell you he was hugely influenced by Greg Brown coming up. As a young man, he was born and raised in Wisconsin. He released his solo debut album, Miles from the Lightning, in 2001, and has also released a whole string of great albums, plus uh, recordings with Redbird and his rock band called Satellite. He lives here in Western Massachusetts with his wife, Chris Delmorst, and their daughter, Hazel. So uh, these guys share a love of fly fishing. They uh, love old guitars. They love old cars. Who knows what they're going to talk about tonight? But let's bring to the, the screen uh, here uh, Jeffrey Focault and Greg Brown here on the backstage sessions. Hey, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, guys. Good evening. Nice to be here. Sun Sunday evening. I'm going to just let you guys take it away. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. If you're ready, Greg, I'm going to uh, I'm going to begin with a prompt, and this is a poem by my friend Chris Dombrowski. It's called Lunar Calendar. Three moons in particular appear to have it in for me. <laughs> the moon of it gets late early here, the moon of winter stores wearing thin, and the moon of I have to quit fishing and return underappreciated and underpaid to work. Of course, there's also the moon of too many plastic presents and cups of unspiked nog, not to mention the moon of everybody but me flies to a beach town and drinks free margaritas. And while I take rare comfort in the moon of we start anyway to get some color back in our cheeks, it often devolves into the moon of crunching numbers for the man. Praise be, though, to the moon of long, larch-colored light. Unless, of course, you are an herbivorean ungulate, in which case it becomes the moon of dodging hurtling pieces of lead. Moon of not too much, but a little more light each day, I thank you, and beg you not to morph into the moon that recalls the time she left for good. This goes as well for the moon of picking wild asparagus, which doubles as the moon of when I caught her in the backyard kissing him, A.K. AKA the moon of when all resentment ripens. But moon of we finally get our fleece on and watch you refracting light onto the peaks first dusting, you redeem all other God cast stones. 
As do you, moon of when the muddy water clears and trout can see my flies again, which leaves just you. Moon of wool hats at night, but naked lake swims at noon. Moon of ripe huckleberries by the fist full. Moon of dragonflies cupped in daughter's palms. Moon of everything, even talking to a mute stone is all right. So my question is, what moon has it been for you, Greg Brown? Oh, my Lord. Uh, the moon of poking around. That's mostly what I've been doing, poking yeah. around. Fortunately, I'm really good at it. I'm very good at <laughs> Probably my biggest talent, I'd say, is poking around. Yeah. I've often thought that's really what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. Poke around. Spend a little time in the day, yeah. get nothing yeah. done. Yeah. Well, I mean, that actually... The next thing I was going to ask is, the last time I saw you, you said that you were uh, pretty much done with touring. Uh-huh. And then it turned out that was just great timing, because we were all done with touring. And uh, I know how it yeah. feels to me after 20 years on the road, but I wonder, uh, how does it feel for you? Yeah, it's kind of ironic. Uh, yeah, I did my last gig, I think. I believe it was in August. Uh, of 2019 at the Big yeah. Top Chautauqua. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I played that with Bo. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had, I don't know if you've been back to the Chautauqua, they put a new cover over the whole thing. Oh, wow. Over the whole tent. Is it the same size or bigger? Yeah, same size. It's just like a tent on a tent, kind of. Okay. But it's yeah. some kind of super fabric. Of yeah, I haven't been for maybe 10 years or something. Yeah. Well, that night there was an unbelievable thunderstorm up there. I mean, some of the time Bo and I couldn't hear each other when we were playing. <laughs> the rain was that hard on the, and lightning and thunder. It was an amazing storm. And uh, I still don't know if God was saying, good job, Greg, or <laughs> shut up and go home. <laughs> uh, but it was quite a dramatic uh storm you know quite a, a way to end and that was uh that was it that was my last gig Damn. so yeah it was uh late summer i did you know i did a couple three benefits after that here and there yep uh but uh that was the last gig so and then it was uh, the next march i guess when this whole deal started so yeah yeah we were on the road we were in um i was playing trio with uh eric haywood and Jeremy Curtis, we were in uh, north of Phoenix, up by Flagstaff, and mm -hmm. I called somebody who's a good friend of mine who uh, worked for the State Department for a long time, and she was read in on the, uh, you know, security stuff, and she, mm -hmm. I said, you know, can I stay out here and finish this tour? We, she said, how, how much longer do you have to go? I was like, well, we got to get out to West Texas, and um, I think we have five more gigs, and she said, how much money are you going to lose if you, if you fly home? And I was like, you know, I told her, and she was like, go home. <laughs> huh. So, so yeah. you know, we changed flights. We drove back to Phoenix and put everybody on a plane that day. And that was, that's, I think, a, a year ago, almost a year ago today, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, Iris was doing gigs out uh, in the Northwest. She had played uh, Portland, if I remember right. And she was due to play Seattle, and she canceled that one, and I think another one or two gigs, and came home. Yeah, uh, it was you know right around like a, that same time. Yeah, it was such a freak out. You know, you're in the airport. Half the people have masks on, the other people yeah. don't. Half of them are bitching that it's all uh -huh. fake. You know. Yeah. 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 It's just really well, hard to know. Yeah. All right. Well, let me. I I have a clipboard from when I was uh, the camp director at a Y camp <laughs> in. Uh, California years ago, and I yeah. found my clipboard, and I wrote out some questions. So, okay, <laughs> uh, what is your what is your morning routine <coughs> in the uh, like? I every morning I get up, and it's like the exact damn thing, you know. Like I get up, it's about it's anywhere from four thirty to about five. Oh wow! I, in the morning. In the I morning, know, I didn't know there was a four thirty in the morning. Well, God help me! I don't necessarily want to be up then, but you know, like everything happens the same way. I get up, I put my pants yeah. on, right, and then I walk yeah. downstairs yeah. and. Build a fire, make some coffee, read the book, uh -huh. start thinking about stuff. What's your morning look like? Well, uh, generally speaking, I wake up and uh, 
I I come out to the kitchen and I make uh, I make a I make a uh, I think they're called Yeti cups. A friend of mine gave me it's a, like an insulated cup. It yeah, that's a company down in Texas makes yeah, coolers and stuff. Yeah, and I make uh, I make a big cup of coffee and then I've got a little cabin out in the backyard where I. Uh, work Ooh. supposedly, uh, <laughs> and I go out there and you know poke around. What time of the day coffee. is this? Oh, you know, I'd say generally speaking around nine. Oh, okay, that's yeah. that's, that's pretty yeah. legit. Yeah. Uh, what are you uh, What are you working on? Are you working? Do you feel well, like you're working? Yeah. Are you, you know just... I it's you know what songwriting is like at least for me. It uh, uh, my songwriting slowed way down since I quit touring. Huh. Because the one thing I learned was touring and writing and uh, performing, all that's kind of connected, you know. Uh, when yeah. you and recording, it's all kind of one uh, thing in a way, or it was for me. Uh, yeah. And so, when I stopped touring, uh, I just kind of stopped everything for a little while and just thought, well, I'm gonna give it a break. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and then I've been doing some writing once in a while. I've gotten into writing, and I'll write a few songs. And uh, I haven't really been thinking about recording much. Uh, I mean, I'm not touring, and uh, you know what recording is like for musicians these days. I mean, CDs have turned into kind of promo or something. I mean, there yeah. uh, it's everything's uh, streaming and so forth now. So I'm not sure. I've thought about maybe uh, as I write more songs, I've thought about putting some of them on the internet, you know, uh, yeah, like on YouTube or somewhere. I might do that, some of that eventually. Well, and even you know, I you you released a, I think your last one, you did a CD Baby thing. You told me, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Well, CD yeah. Baby, you know, they have all those distro relationships. I don't know if this is inside baseball for everybody or what, but. They have all those distro relationships, and they'll put you up on Spotify and all those, all the various. There's a million streaming platforms, uh-huh. like ones you never heard of, ones I never heard of. Yeah. But they have the, you know, that's the label used to do distro, and now there's no such thing as distro because they just it all goes sure. into the same yeah. platforms. So yeah. you don't, you could put it on YouTube, but YouTube doesn't pay anything to anybody for anything. Oh, I so. know. I, if I was putting out songs, I'd just put put putting them out to just put them out. Just I, if I do. Them. If I do do another uh, recording of some kind, I'll definitely go with CD Baby again. They've been they're very easy to work with. And, uh, yeah, I've worked with them on yeah. various projects on and off for twenty odd years, and they've been mm-hmm. uniformly uh, great. Yeah, well, so that's know. interesting. So that leads the next thing I was going to ask you was um, uh, I've read interviews with you where you talk about writing, and it's like. Um, almost a sort of a form of dictation, like a song harasses you until you <laughs> write it down, right? And, yeah, that's pretty uh, much true, yeah. Uh-huh. And, but you've made like, or you, you made 30, almost 30 records, right? Maybe 26, 27 me. I've records. I've never counted them. I, well, I, I mean, made you, too many, I'm sure of that. But. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I learned that on Wikipedia, and they have said crazy, they said I was a celebrated balloon artist at one point, so I don't know. It could be, <laughs> it could be all nonsense, right? But... Yeah. Uh, my question uh, is, if it's not just picking up the, the red phone and, and getting a song, do you have a dis- discipline? Like you said, you go out to your place every day. Like showing up to me is half the, half the deal, right? Uh-huh. Like you just you show up yeah. and then you wait for something good to happen. If you're the guy who's sitting there with a guitar and a pencil, then like the chances that you'll be ready if something good comes at you which is the only yeah. stuff, like the stuff you can think of yourself isn't usually that interesting, right? Yeah, I never had any kind of uh, a uh, uh, a way of going about writing. Uh, but most of the songs I wrote, I would say, I, I wrote when I was out walking around or driving. Yeah. Or walking in some strange city or trying to do something else. Uh, yeah. So that's mostly when songs would come to, come to me. And I'll hear a little something, and my foot will tap, and I'll start mumbling. And then, you know, something may come out of that. But it was, I never, uh, I don't, I can't remember actually sitting, playing a guitar while I was trying to make up a song. That, the playing always came along later. Uh, so you would make up a song and remember it? 
Well, my 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 thought was that if it's good, I'll remember it. <laughs> no, I may have been off on that, but you know, I would just uh, then when I got to wherever I was going, you know, I would if I thought I had something and I remembered it, I would tape it yep. uh, uh, with a cassette, a little cassette player, and like, like a know, mini tape kind of thing. No, just a regular little oh, cassette yeah, okay. player. Uh, I'd record it and then. Uh, in fact, I remember one time I was writing a song called uh, Whatever It Was, and mm -hmm. I was driving between St. Paul and uh, home, and the song started while I was driving the car, and it's just like verse after verse. It's getting crazy. Yeah. So I stopped in Rochester, and <laughs> I went to a Target or somewhere and bought a portable, one of those little tape recorders, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I went yeah. out to the car and taped what I had. I think that's the only time I remember doing that. But there were getting to be so many verses. Uh, that's a that's a that's a hell of a song I I have in here. It's a drifting time. People are obsessed with screens. No okay. idea what's on the other side. We stare at doom like an uptight groom, and live our lives like a drunken bride. And the question yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. You're like a month older than my dad, right? Mm -hmm. Arguably very different lives and experiences. But uh, something that I've noticed about baby boomers as a rule yeah. mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is that they're very susceptible to technology and sort of there, there's a, like an unwariness where that song expresses this very deep wariness about the interaction with screens that seem to be like, growing oh, over the whole country like creeper vine, you know, sort of choking yeah, the culture. Uh -huh, yeah. So I I wondered if your own personal interaction with screens, which is something that you've, you know, made a point of critiquing, uh, do you feel like it has taken over your own experience of day-to-day -day life? And if not, how do you, do you no, build a structure no, into your no. life so, so you're not, you know, like, tech I, doesn't... I, I have a phone like everybody else, and... Uh, but I no, I I'm not susceptible to uh, spending hours on uh, Twitter. Or, you know, uh, I can't. Stand <laughs> oh, so glad. I don't like Facebook. Uh, you know, uh, I just was not susceptible to. It. I, on the other hand, I I don't, I'm not a real anti. I mean, I think technology has done a lot for a lot of people, especially during this crisis. You know, where people could talk to each other, and I've, I've often thought about. <laughs> Older folks who are, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, uh, sol you know, uh, on their own. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's, I think the technology has been great for them. I just, myself, I, I don't know. And I'm not good at it. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, I bought several of these little home recorder things that look like they'd just be just a step up maybe from a tape player. But then they come with a booklet about that thick. Mm. And you know, if you want to do X, Y, blah, 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 blah. And yeah. I, 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 so I'm not good at it. So that's kept me from being uh, uh, real involved with it either. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, let's, what else was I going to ask you? Oh, you know, so you're, you, you and Iris are uh, married and you're both songwriters who've traveled for a long time and i'm married to chris delmhorst mm -hmm, and right. uh, people always ask um like they want to believe that we just pretty much sit around playing songs at each other all day <laughs> right like yeah. we were sort of making really <coughs> beautiful faces yeah. at each other and uh that really doesn't happen i was curious uh, if it happened no. to you, you no, guys not, much... <laughs> no not at all uh no. iris generally speaking well she'll sing with me around the house you know or in the car mm -hmm. But we very rarely uh, sung on stage, maybe at a few festivals. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's kind of like me, like when she wants to write something, she goes someplace and yeah. kind of isolates herself. And, uh, yeah, we don't, uh, uh, we, we don't, I, I, you know, once in a while my, we might uh, be goofing around and one of us will say a line and the other one will say, oh, you should put that in something. It's, that's about as far as it goes. Yep, yep, yeah, same here. Yeah. It's smart to have a shack in the yard. I don't, I have a barn, but it's not heated, so it's hard to imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I have an office, you, you know. Get a wood stove there, Jeff. <laughs> put it in the barn? Yeah. I could put it in the barn. There's, there's no uh, 
there's no meaningful insulation in there, but the wood stove might yeah. keep it warm enough to at least get something done. I well, did put an amp know, in there one time. You could wall off one corner or something like that, you know, yeah. with some plywood and then put a little wood stove in there. That's actually not, yeah. that's not a terrible idea. I've never thought about doing in it. In the barn I had in Happy Marty, the uh, place we, uh, we used to live down in Southern Iowa, yeah. I, I, I had fixed up that barn some. It was a little barn, too. And I did have a, a wood stove down there that pretty much did the job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would be curious. Uh, I would be curious if I would ever get to use it. I think uh, Chris uh-huh. would go. Chris would go in there, and then I would like never. Oh, <laughs> I'd never get to use it again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you. Oh, this is one thing I was wondering about. Can you tell me? Three records that you remember that your parents had that they played around the house? Uh, probably, if I think about it a minute. Uh, these records, I'm not... They might have been uh, Paul and Ma's... Uh, I don't know the... Uh, I remember a, Hyde, a record of Haydn symphonies. I think my mother had that. Oh, yeah. She played that quite a bit. I know that around the house was a Harry Belafonte record that I loved. Mm-hmm. Makes perfect sense. And there was a Johnny Cash uh, record, uh-huh. which I loved, which was, the record was called Ring of Fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, I had a Barbara Streisand record that I, when mm-hmm. I was, you know, like 12, I really liked. Huh. Uh, My mom had all those Barbara Streisand records. I listened to them. You know, oh, when I was like oh, yeah. 11 or 12, yeah. I found the LP collection and I went through everything. Yeah, and had this weird sort of baby boomer musical education compressed into uh-huh. just yeah. two years or something. But uh, so starting <laughs> with Chubby Checker yeah. all the oh, way up. Oh sure, to, Chubby Checker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chubby yeah. Checker does the twist to uh, yeah, sure. to like Highway sixty one or whatever. And, yeah, uh, sure. She had Barbara Streisand, and uh, when I was real little, she always listened to uh, Judy Collins. And the record jacket oh, would, yeah. would be out, and she had those piercing blue eyes, and I was kind of yeah. scared of her. Headlights, yeah. Yeah, when, yeah, when right. I was tiny. Yeah. Uh, have you have you written any songs recently? Is that a thing? Yeah, you yeah. Doing? This last six months, I've probably written I don't know five or six new ones. I would say something like yeah. that. Would their songs like- are always a surprise to me, you know, because I never. Uh, I never have any idea when they're going to show up or what they're going to be. But I've learned over the years I have to get with them. You know, I I can't really... I mean, sometimes I'll write a little batch of songs and I'll really like the groove of them and how they're going. I think I'm going to write some more of those. Uh-uh. Uh, yeah. you, I just got to wait and listen and see what uh, comes along. Yeah. And do you... Well, that's uh, enough. Do you... Um... Do you feel like playing something new? Do you, would you feel like playing a song at all? Well, I could try. I don't. I, I I don't know how well I know this song, but I'll try one. Uh... This bottle or that bottle? Are you sure you're sure? I've been saving both of them, hoping one might be the cure. Oh, I've known there's something wrong with me. Ever since I was a child. This bottle or that bottle, which one would you like? In the library, my father built of stone. He called it the family room, a good place to be alone. Oh, there's nothing like a lazy boy. A lamp, a rug, and a throw. Take a load off, come and sit. Where is there to go? I just love the way the evening comes around. Like tons of angels calling. Flutter down 
like leaves, like spirits calling. Don't worry about which model. Go ahead, have some. I can assure you there's plenty more where they come from if you've noticed much the world I'm sure you will agree this bottle or that bottle they're all the same to me Welcome to eternity. Thank you so much for playing that song. Oh, sure. That was, of that was really a delight to hear. Oh, thank you. You, yeah. you know, it reminded me... Uh, it reminded me of a lot of different things, but um, there's that early live record of yours called One Night... Uh -huh. That I gather was sort of lost for a while, didn't come out. I think so. It was a little a club in uh, uh, Minneapolis called the Extempore. I <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Where it's that a bar now. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Every, yeah, like many, many places. Yeah. Uh, and on that record, I was going through and I was sort of listening back through your songs. And on that record, you seem to be working your way through classic song forms, which that... That song, you know, uh, at least if it doesn't exemplify a classic song form, it sort of rhymes with some of the song forms that you hear, like the old Tin Pan uh -huh. Alley songs and stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, the old, yeah, And yeah. Down the, on the One Night record, it sounded to me like you took a bunch of those forms and you put them into strange alternate tunings, uh, yeah. Open C... Or, you know, for Banjo Moon, right? Where you took a tune oh, that, yeah. you know, instead yeah. of like moving slow and being a bunch of open sevens and stuff like you've got and, and minor chords jungled up against each other the way you did on that song. To, it's real hard to play that song in open C. I remember figuring it out when I was like 25 wow. or something, you know? I completely and, forgot that song, Banjo Moon. <laughs> it's a great damn song. But anyways, yeah. uh, I remember thinking, I wonder... I know that when you went out west after you were in New York, uh, I gather that you went out and you lived in like Portland and Las Vegas and California and stuff. Las Vegas we went to first, Las Vegas, and then L.A., and then up the coast to a little town called Hoquim, Aberdeen. That's a good order. I'm glad yeah. it went that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, But you were working, like, at some point you worked for Buck Ram, right? Is that where you started yeah. thinking about the uh, actual uh, formal chops of oh writing God, a song? Oh, God, no, no. I, was, I didn't learn much from Buck. <laughs> Uh, sorry to say, but he was a fascinating character. I was in a trio back then with uh, Paul and Marcia, who was married after that uh, beer keep. And Marcia had been in a, a all female rock and roll band. I, I can't remember. It might have been called Fanny, but I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Uh, but anyway, Marcia, somewhere in their travels, they had run into Buck, uh, yep. who knows where. Anyway, he had invited her uh, to bring her band, which was me and Paul, out to Vegas, and uh, we, we would do some recording. Uh, and we went out there, and we worked, worked, and worked uh, for months. Uh, on Buck had this thing called Blend. It was almost mystical. He was looking for something like the Platters, you know. Yeah, right, he right. Started the Platters. Had the big hit. And we never, we didn't achieve blend. We <laughs> we might have got to blah, but we, <laughs> blah. We, we never made it all the way. So anyway, we ended up taking off out of there eventually. But I would sit and write songs with Buck because Buck was, he had a lot of artists in development, he called it. Uh, <laughs> solos, uh, vocal groups, all kinds of different people. Yeah. And he was trying to, he wanted new songs. So, uh We'd sit at this little blonde spinet piano uh, and uh, working on songs. And we wrote several of probably the worst songs that were written <laughs> right, right in there somewhere. Tell me you have one, one called of these songs. One called Snow on the Mountain, which 
and another one called Why in the Name of God. Uh, it, oh, it's awful. Uh, far, <laughs> I hope there's no recordings anywhere. But anyway, it was Buck had a million stories, of course. I mean, uh, he told about writing uh, uh, The Great Pretender when he was on the toilet at some big <laughs> club casino. A lot of stories, you know. He was quite a storyteller. So, I, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, I was 19 or 20. And we're knocking around. Vegas was just a little town in the desert back then, you know. It was right, so right, right. different than what it is now. But anyway, Blend didn't work out, so we uh, went to L.A. and uh, auditioned for the Holiday Inn circuit. So we were right. broke, flat broke, uh, and we took off out of there. Who was booking the Holiday Inn circuit? Well, it was a woman in Hollywood. Uh, she had a... Uh, like an agency. An agency, yeah, and you went in there, uh, next, you know, you went in <laughs> and did your thing. And, yeah. of course, uh, we ended up uh, playing our way Holiday Inns from uh, L.A. all the way to uh, somewhere in Wisconsin, actually, Racine. <laughs> it was Racine. That was our last gig, and it was supposed to be two week. It was supposed to be a two-week. You played uh, six nights a week, I think, in the Damn. lounge. And, uh, but you got room and board. Yeah. And so we played, we ended up playing in Racine for 11 weeks. It was oh. wintertime. Nobody <laughs> wanted to come to Racine, Wisconsin. <laughs> so they kept the management of the Holiday Inn kept saying, well, how about just a couple more weeks? So, okay. but anyway, that, you know, you make, it was tremendous money for me back then. I think you made 250 bucks a week plus. You didn't have anywhere to spend it. Uh, I mean, that's actually so, that's great money. It was great yeah, money. I mean, that's, this that's was like nineteen seventy, probably nineteen seventy. Yeah. I would right. say somewhere in there. Well, so yeah, my you know, Billy is fond of pointing out that a five hundred dollar gig in nineteen eighty is still a five hundred dollar gig now, and the that's only difference true. is true. is that five hundred dollars is worth like a fifth of of what it was. You know, I yeah, mean, if you, that's very true. Yeah, you know, people. I remember reading once that if you tied the minimum wage to inflation back in like 1985, it would be up over twenty five dollars an hour right now. Iris was just saying, telling me about that yesterday. We we're talking about that. You, you wonder know. why everybody's got to have three jobs or whatever to get uh -huh. by. Well, and there you go. Yeah, that's it, it's right? uh, it's really criminal what's going on. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you, who were, do you remember who you were listening to the hardest when you started? Writing tunes? Well, you know, the uh, one of the base, bases of everything I've done it was playing with my grandparents. Uh, yeah. Grandpa played banjo, and Grandma played the pump organ, and neighborhood people played fiddles and everything else. And by the time I was six, I was sitting in on those. And it was all, you know, a lot of it was Appalachian tunes because a lot of people in southern Iowa had come from you know, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Kentucky. Right, back uh, in like the 1820s and 30s. Well, yeah, they had come in there, but then a lot of them came over to southern Iowa, I would say like in the 1870s, 1880s, because there was uh, railroads were coming oh, in. Yeah, and And yeah. uh, southern Iowa was uh, coal mining country. Huh. Uh, all across southern Iowa, was, it was soft coal. I had no idea. But, yeah. It was Southern Iowa is very hilly and woody, and the dirt is clay. It's not good, <laughs> uh, and so that was coal mining country. So a lot of those people came over from there, and my grandpa actually worked on the old steam engine railroad. But that drew a lot of those people, and that music, of course, fiddle banjo, old mountain tunes, ballads. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That all came along with them. So that's the first music I really was a part of. And then my dad, being a preacher, of course, I heard all the old hymns. And, so those are and then those... I kind of just got into everything from there, you know. But that was my uh, still the Carter. The Carter family was pretty much the beat of yep. those old tunes. And uh, still, if I hear if I hear though that old kind of thump thump beat, I'm like, yeah, yeah. that sort of <laughs> that just up down kind of two yeah. feel. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm going to ask you one more before I move on. Sure. Uh, 
Was there ever a time, and I suspect I know the answer, was there ever a time when you thought, fuck it, I quit? Oh, yeah, sure, okay. absolutely. There were several times, but the big one was probably when I was about 30 or so. And I'd been out, you know, I'd had a lot of odd jobs, but I'd, I'd managed to make kind of a living for four or five years, but I couldn't see it going anywhere. Yeah, I just yeah. thought, man, I don't know that I want to be 40 you know, uh, drive around in my car playing uh, little uh, college bars. Yep. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'm going to quit. And I, I loved it. I, I immediately felt like a load was off my shoulders. Uh, and I already had plans. I was going to go back to school. I was going to get a degree in some kind of forestry. Ooh. And uh, try and aim for a job as some kind of a ranger, somebody living out, you know, taking care of uh, some woods. Uh, well, I had no more made that decision. I got a call from uh, Willie N or uh, Carlos Santana's people. They wanted to record one of my songs. Uh, I got a call from the Prairie Home Companion yeah. asking me if I would like to come be on the show. Three or four things just bam happened when I when I had made up my mind. And if they hadn't happened, I would that would I would have quit. That would have been it. Yeah, it would have been it. But I, all of a sudden, some doors opened, you know. And then once I was doing the Prairie Home Show, that made it possible for me to tour a lot right. more. I met Bob Feldman, and I'd already started this little label, which was really just a box of records. And, and that was to make to make which record? Forty four? Or that would have been uh, that would have been the Iowa Waltz. Oh yeah, the one that was yeah. funded by the by that tour around the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so a bunch of stuff happened that made it possible for me to stay in. Right, they just Carlos Santana. He just reeled you back in. Yeah, it was the guys at Muscle Shoals. You know, Jerry. Uh, I can't know. You remember those producers who worked out of Muscle Shoals? They're both uh, work. ultra famous, but yeah, yeah I watched uh, Barry the Beckett. Barry Beckett yep. was the guy who called me up, and he yeah. said, uh, and I had sent a tape because I had a, a kind of a dance band a rhythm and blues band at the time and i had sent a tape being totally naive i had sent a tape to muscle shoals because i liked that sound <laughs> and yes. they were in there working on a santana record okay and barry beckett said well i'm not so sure about your band but we like this one <laughs> song so uh they recorded that song yeah uh, so yeah, and the, this is the when you say dance band, this is like is Dave in the band playing hard? Yeah, Dave Moore, a guy named Chuck Henderson on guitar, and we had uh, Mike Watts on drums, and a uh, uh, Dave Hansen on. We had a good little. Dance. I mean, we played you know joints where people were dancing. Yeah, That's, people that jump around. Idea. We played in Iowa City. We played Chicago. We played Milwaukee. We played many, pretty much the Midwest. You know, we had yeah, an old yeah. van. We had an old van and went knocking around and. Uh, Go out and play like three on the weekend, Thursday, Friday, yeah, Saturday? Yeah, exactly, because everybody had jobs. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, they asked me to do a song, and I'm going to play one, Great. and that'll, cool. that'll lead me into... Um, what do you got? The next... What are you playing there, Jeffrey? What is that? This is a guitar made by a guy named uh, uh, Dobbins out in uh -huh. California, and he, yeah. a sweet guy, he wrote me and said, I'd like to build you a guitar, and I said, okay. Nice. You Great. don't say no. And it's kind of, it's built yeah. on the specs of a Nick Lucas uh Oh wow! Yeah, uh, but he used a salvaged um, spruce from an old, like a hundred-year-old piano. Very and cool. And some real pretty uh, wow. Honduran mahogany oh, yeah. on the nice on job. the back. But it's you know what I do with it? I leave it. I leave it. Uh, I Don't put like resophonic gauge strings on it. Oh, I don't even know what those are. Like. Uh, like uh, you know, if a regular low end string is going to be like a fifty six, this would be oh. like a sixty two or something. Oh my! Oh yeah, I bet but Joe Price I, uses those. And then yeah. tune it way the hell down, sort of like a semi baritone. Uh huh. So this Great. is in a. It, it sounds like it doesn't rattle too much. Now you know the tension. I think is actually lower than than open D would be on a standard guitar. Uh -huh. It can be good. a little floppy when you play the when you play the low notes. Yeah. And you get a little chunk that, in there. That always happens. That ain't so bad, though. Sometimes it sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I'll do this song. I, we, the band has been doing this on the road for the last, you know, five or seven mm. years. This is an old Reiner uh, Tachek song called uh, The Farm, which I'm sure you... Oh, Reiner. Oh, so great. I love this song. Yeah. So 
someone I know Taught me Without Really teaching About this world now It's not like it was then It even rains More often I remember the fall now Mama's bright dress And the look on your face When she left Oh How did we ever survive So much missing Never came back It just stayed missing I feel I'm growing radar Receiving messages From out in the place Someone, somewhere, someplace out there. as good as I have felt lately Oh Lily I love you I don't know how I ever, ever got back without you but someone somewhere someplace how Tune. Beautiful, that's a great job. That's Thank a beautiful you. song, isn't it? It's a heartbreaker of a song. Oh, uh, it is. I know. Uh, I wanted yeah. to ask you about your, you know, I walked into a a cafe. Chris and I were on a tour down there just one time where we went out together mm -hmm. playing like a split bill thing just in Arizona and, and New Mexico. And uh, we walked into this little cafe and there was a poster and it was for a split bill, you and Reiner. And, mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, we did a number of those. Yeah. And I just wondered about your what, your relationship with him, and sort of what you took away from that. What you remember about oh, that Reiner. time? Yeah, uh, Reiner and I met. Uh, we actually got uh, he he we did a, a bill at a church in Tucson. Uh, some folks decided some probably, and I had <laughs> friends. Unitarians. Uh, Probably, no <laughs> doubt. Uh, I had friends, Pat and Margie, uh, who were from Iowa, who'd been living in Tucson for a while. And uh, they knew Reiner. Reiner played all over town uh, with Das Combo, which yeah, was man. his band. Uh, but uh, Reiner came over to the house, to Pat and Margie's house, after we did our show. And I remember uh, Reiner and I sat, and there was kind of a porch room Yep. And people were gathered out there. And Ryan and I sat down and started playing, and we just played the G chord. 
<laughs> he had his uh, metal body guitar, and I had yeah. a wooden. And we just started playing the G chord, and that's all we played. <laughs> we played G for at least half an hour. And people at first thought it was kind of cute or something, you know. And then people just started drifting away back out into the uh, house. And Ryan and I sat there for another 20 minutes just looking at each other, smiling and playing the G chord. You know, variations on the G chord. Yeah, but that's yeah. all we did. And uh, then we were done and we put the guitars down. That's how we met. And then we did a lot of shows in Tucson. I finally talked him into... He hardly played in the States, you know. He yeah, worked yeah, at yeah. The, he worked at the Chicago store. And his uh, band, and he used to play with uh, Giant Sand, which was a band, a band back then, too. Yep. Which Hal Gelb was in. I don't know if you're familiar with Hal Gelb. I know Hal, just a little, he, just a great, little bit. Yeah. Great guy. Fantastic. But, uh, yeah, so Ryan and I did, oh, I don't know, probably six, eight gigs together there in Tucson. And then... After Reiner got ill, I did a number of benefits down there, and Hal Gelb did too. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I loved Reiner, and there was nobody. Uh, I mean, he had these two funky pedals, an echo and a delay, maybe. He had them rigged up. He'd sit on his little amp and play this, uh, either a wooden body or sometimes a metal body uh, national. Yeah. And the, he he would he had his little wig, and he would play riff. He had a pedal. And that somehow that would loop that, the riff he just played. And then he would start playing over that and sing it. And I, I've heard a lot of people try and do stuff like that that is so cornball. It's just amazing. But with Reiner, it was just beautiful. It was otherworldly. Well, it you know, those two pedals. When you hear somebody with a looper, nine times out of ten, they hit record, right, on the top of the, of the measure, and then they play inside the measure. And then they build this yeah. terrible yeah. stack yeah. of stuff that you don't want to hear, yeah. right? That's right. And it's is masturbatory. Yeah. And then Reiner would, yeah. would, would create a figure or a texture, yeah. and he'd hit his little pedal. It was like an eight-second loop. Yeah. yeah. And he'd get an organic figure that, that, that repeated unequal yeah. to the measure. Yeah. And it would come in. And I don't know how the hell he did it because it would come in at the just exact right time, this crazy high sound or something, I don't right? know. Yeah, sometimes he would lean forward and holler into the guitar, too. He'd get a little <laughs> yeah. scream sound, which would loop. Uh, yeah, he was just uh, resonator jump. I talked him one time into going. He, he and I went out to California, and we played in uh, Southern California. We played L.A. No, I don't, I don't know if we played L.A. or not. We probably did. But we played uh, as far down as uh, San Diego. We did like four gigs along that stretch of California. Yeah. That's the only tour we ever did. Now. Where would you play in San Diego? Like the Casbah? Uh, there was some club north of town. Uh, oh, this yeah. was a long time ago. Del Mar, maybe. But uh, we played there. We had a great time. I remember right before I was flying down, yeah. Renner called me up and he said, uh, Greg, what kind, of car, what kind of car did you rent? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, right? I have a Ford or something. Can you get a Cadillac? He's. I'll pay for the extra. I said, Yeah, I'll get a Cadillac, right? So I, <laughs> I rented a big old Cadillac. Oh and, my uh, God! Uh, we drove all the way out to. Ryan was on. You know, Ryan was somebody I I communicated with in some other way. I mean, we'd talk a little bit, yeah. but we were we could drive for hours and not say a word, and yet we would be in communication. I can't really uh, totally define it, it, but it was, it was just like that with me and him. That's, that's a, that's a beautiful thing to hear about. Yeah. That uh, was a great version of that song, Jeffrey. That was really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I got just a couple, um, a couple more things and I still want to see if I can get one more song out of you, but, uh, I was reading, William Carlos Williams this oh, week because yeah. it's Doctor. spring, right? Yeah, sure. And, uh, and I, in the preface to this book, I can't remember who wrote it, but uh, mm -hmm. I found this beautiful quote, which is, you know, both T.S. Eliot's first book uh, and uh, and Carlos's, uh, Williams' first book came out in 17, like at the same time. That'd be and about they, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're going, obviously, in different directions. But the, the, the quote from Ezra Pound... He said, uh, a certain rustic uncouthness, 
<laughs> whose end is celebration and uh -huh. which wears the stamp of locality. And that uh -huh. uh, made me think about this inter uh, interview or conversation. And I made me wonder um, what it meant to you. You know, I, uh, when I met Chris, I, I moved east you know we compromised uh -huh. and she moved a hundred miles west and i moved a thousand miles east and we yeah. met up in the middle yeah uh -huh. and uh i wonder what it meant to you to stay home like to stay in iowa instead of going to new york city you know like pound uh, and elliot and everybody went overseas right the lost generation oh yeah sure william yeah. stayed in new jersey and yeah well he went over there too for visits he was all over europe uh but he he lived at home too and and uh uh I think he delivered uh, over 3,000 babies, I believe. Red, Red is a doctor. But he was quite a guy, Dr. Williams. Uh, yeah, uh, there's nobody quite like him. Do you yeah, think that staying in Iowa... Oh, yeah, see, I, your... you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I know for sure I would not have stayed in Iowa if I hadn't have been a, a musician who was traveling. Uh, I right. think I would have gotten kind of claustrophobic Stay, uh, staying in the, Iowa City is a pretty cool little town, you know, with yeah. a lot of arts and stuff going on. But I, if I hadn't been uh, doing what I was doing, I, I'm not sure I would have stayed, at all that I would have stayed here. Yeah. Uh, but it was centrally located. For, <laughs> yeah. If I was going east or west or south, it was about the same. And I did have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of good musical friends here. You know, people like Bob Black and Al Murphy and Dave Moore, and mm -hmm. a lot. There was a lot of people around who played music. So, and I also I always loved visiting cities. Like I went to New York when I was a kid, and I, that's where I started playing. Yeah, I was there for maybe I don't know four or five months, and I loved being in the cities. Uh, I even like L.A., but I don't <laughs> like them for a real, real long time. I, yep. I tend to get a little claustrophobic. I tend to need to be out in the open more. Yeah, but uh, yeah. It took me ten years living in New England to not get mad about the trees being too close to the road. You know, like, <laughs> you know if you grow yeah, up in the Midwest, yeah. you expect sure. the trees to be a good mile away across right. a field, and it just—I right. felt like I couldn't see anything. Yeah. Or you know, yeah. and then people yeah. who live out here, they go to the Midwest, and they're like, they feel completely unprotected, like they're going to be oh, attacked yeah. at any moment. Because I no, know, uh, yeah. yeah, I had a good friend, Whitty Hall, who ran a club up in yeah. New Hampshire, who was from there, and she said the first time she drove out west, she kept, she wanted them, she was sure something was going to come at her. <laughs> she wasn't used to that big, wide sky. It spooked her, you know. Yeah. It just yeah. scared her. You know? But out here, you know, like I live tucked right in against a river valley, right on the side of the hill, more or less, and mm -hmm. uh, the weather all comes from the other side of that hill. Sure. And it can, in yeah. 10 minutes, you can go from a bright yeah. sunshine to black, and I'm used to being able to see it coming for just days right or at oh, least yeah. hours mm -hmm. yeah hours anyway yeah yeah uh oh. well let's see i don't i don't i was gonna give you the lightning round actually and uh maybe i'll ask you just a, a couple of those oh you know what i was gonna ask you this is a thing i read years ago in the um in the new yorker magazine in the little front piece where they advertise who's coming to town and what's happening which mm -hmm. is usually the best part and uh yeah. uh it said uh, Greg Brown and Bo Ramsey are the most instantly recognizable voice in electric guitar pairing since Johnny Cash and Luther Perkins. Well, my, my. Which I thought was spot on and a beautiful thing. And I wondered what your relationship with Bo musically or otherwise has meant in your... Oh, in it's, your it's, deal. All, it's, it's too much to even <laughs> start to get into, but... It's not really a I lightning remember round I, I, I I, I was aware of both for a long time. We both had bands. Yeah. Uh, and we were playing the same kind of joints. But uh, I had been in Europe for my first time. Uh, I'd done a little tour over there and I wrote a bunch of songs and I came home and I realized I needed a band to record them with and I didn't have a band anymore. So I went to Bo and I said, look, I just, we knew each other some. And I went to him and I said, I got this little bag of songs. Uh, and so we made a record uh, together, and that's how we got going together. The record was called One Big Town. Yeah. And, uh, and then Bo and I started doing, uh, not long after that, really, we started 
uh, doing dual gigs, you know, largely for economic reasons. We couldn't <laughs> afford to take a band out on the road. I, I know all about but it. But Bo and I, we tried some gigs, just the two of us, and it worked pretty good, you know. Bo was a wonderful guitar player. And uh, so it just musically it worked out really good. We had a lot of the same... Bo was pretty much blues. Yep. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, I was, I'd be liable to put in, uh, you know, some weird stuff when we were driving along and Bo would be like, Jesus, but, <laughs> but musically, uh, on the kind of songs I was writing, it just worked really well for him yeah. to, it was almost like playing with a band. You know, uh, well, he sits in your pocket in a pretty incredible, like your sense of rhythm on a tune like Jesus and Elvis, right? Where you... Yeah. You, you have a right hand thing that nobody else really has, right? You're doing something uh, that doesn't leave a lot of room, and yet he's just right in there. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's spooky. And I've seen, I, I went and watched like I was curious about it, and um, I was geeking out a little bit and had a drink, and I was gone on YouTube and I watched like four versions of that song, and they're all different. Uh -huh. And you can't throw him. He's like a cocklebird. No, he just uh, sticks to you, right? He's all yeah. it's, it's out. Bo and I, we're really groove players. You know, the one thing we always, I think that's one reason that uh, from the time we started out, we both enjoyed it was we both really are the, our main thing really is finding the groove, getting yep. in the, get that groove. And that's what we both do. So it's, uh, it was really a pleasure to work with them all those years. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I'm not going to use up the rest of your evening. And uh, uh, I was going to see if you want to just play one more tune to lead us out. I want to say thank you yeah. to Signature Sounds and thank yeah, you to... Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks to them, too. I'd like to say that. And thanks to you, Jeffrey. Oh, uh, it's uh, such a pleasure. It really... Uh, it's a ple pleasure to get to hear you talk about this stuff. You know, I have, like, um, about 75 more questions, so I'll just... I'll email those to you. And okay. You can, you can get back at your leisure. <laughs> I'm going away Cause I got a busted heart I'm leaving today This old travel all star mm -hmm. Well, I reckon where I'm headed I'll have to buy me some new clothes Up in Michigan, where the, where the laughing river flows, oh, where it flows. Mm -hmm. Twenty years in the minor leagues, ain't no place I didn't go. Well, I got a few hits, oh, but I, I never made the big show. I can hang on for a few years, doing what I've done before. I'd rather hear that laughing river flow right outside of my door. Cousin Ray, he said he's got a job for me. Where the houses are still cheap, he says he knows this nice lady. He said she even saw me play one time, and smiles at my name. <coughs> Well, up on the Laughing River It'd be a whole new game A whole new game Well, it's goodbye to the bus It's goodbye to paying dues well, it's a goodbye to the cheers. <laughs> goodbye to the booze. 
I'll be trading in this old bag for a, for a brand new fishing pole. I'm gonna let that laughing river flow right into my soul. Oh, right into my soul. I'm going away. I'm going away. I'm going away to where, where the old laughing river flows. Yeah. <coughs> That's Sorry beautiful. Sorry, I'm choked up there. Oh, it sounded good to me. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was really fun. Thank yeah, you, well- to- Thanks to all the folks out there who put this yeah. together. Yeah, Jared and uh, Georgia and Lynn and everybody. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it was a pleasure. I hope uh, when it all starts spinning again, we get to hear yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. I yeah. would love to hear that yeah. record, so I hope you get on it. Okay, I'll try. Yeah. I'll do my best. Okay. okay. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>